I'm not sure if that's what I'm going to tell you or not. So, um, and I actually don't know what the your a priori belief in the difficulty of NP-complete problems are. It, it really, um, you know, different communities believe totally different things about how hard search and optimization problems are. Now I'm digressing a little from my plan talk, but you know, if you talk to like uh, an AI person, they think NP problems are easy. Okay. If you talk to a cryptographer, at least they're hoping that NP problems are hard. And um, so, you know, and there's often uh, a big gap between the problems that people design to be hard and the sort of naturally occurring problems. And uh, so that's, that's actually one, one motivation for this work is um, to try to get a handle on uh, what problems are likely to be the hardest problems, uh, what problems are likely to be somewhat easier. Okay, so, um, okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, a complexity theory that's emerged over the last uh, approximately 15 years uh, that addresses what the likely, you know, what the likely complexity is the exact, or at least some ballpark, worst case complexities of different NP-complete problems are. Um, and one, one thing I want to stress, so I'm going to like give my references in advance for at least for most of the, most of the talk and not have to, to stop to actually uh, give too much credit. Um, but one nice thing that turns out in this area is that uh, the algorithms for these NP-complete problems are also um, the same idea, present the same ideas as the reductions between them that we're going to be looking at. And many times, uh, even, even reductions that don't have an explicit algorithm that you can refer to, say this is sort of the version of that, are, are a formalization of some um, intuition that comes from studying how heuristics for these problems work. Okay. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to look at, for example, the uh, Tarjan and Trojanowski and Ro Robson uh, backtracking algorithms for independent set and show how Johnson and Zegedy translate that into uh, a statement about what the likely um, <coughs> hardest examples of independent set are. Okay. Um, and we're going to look briefly at um, the DPLL method and Okay, so one thing I should say is I can only write out people's name the first time, and if it's the same, I use the initial. Okay, so, um, so the exception is D Davis, Putnam, uh, Log Logman, and Loveland, um, who I'm not writing out their names at all, basically because I'm sort of they sort of created a method rather than a sp specific algorithm, and Avi's going to think talk a lot more about that in a couple of weeks. Next week. Okay. Uh, yeah, he doesn't get a credit at all. <laughs> so I just refer to him as I. <laughs> okay. Do you want to be me? <laughs> Okay, so um, okay, so um, so what happens? A lot of times, the algorithms in the area provided fodder for the reductions. Thinking about the algorithms carefully actually told you something. Uh, you know, even though the algorithms are sort of have you know make limited progress on these problems, they are hard problems. Uh, even that limited progress can often mean a big insight into the relationship between the problems. Okay, so, um, okay, so I'm not going to have, there, there are a huge number of really interesting algorithms for NP-complete problems, more than you might imagine if you haven't looked at this area. Um, I'm only going to have time to touch on a few because the emphasis is going to be on those algorithms that translated into to some insight as far as the relative complexities of these problems. Okay. 
Uh, so the ones I'm going to mention are, uh, in addition to the two I've already talked about, uh, Paturi, Pudlock, and Zane, and Schuller's uh, algorithm for K-set, and Schuller's algorithm for general uh, C and F set. Okay. Um, so, uh, and then um, the papers that I'm going to, on complexity that are not, uh, that I haven't mentioned so far, uh, there's going to, I'm going to try to get to some really, and really neat results by Petrascu and Williams, uh, and maybe hit upon, uh, at least mention in passing, uh, Williams' recent work showing connections between improved exponential time algorithms and lower bounds. But I won't have, that that's really deserves a talk on its own, and I won't have time to really, uh, really do it justice. Okay, so please feel free to interrupt. You know, this is, especially this is billed as a tutorial, so if you don't understand something, please slow me down and make sure I spell it out. So any questions so far? Okay. So, um, so we know that almost by definition, and uh, NP complete problems are all computationally equivalent. They each have a reduction from one to the other, and what that means is that. Um, is that if one is solvable in a reasonable amount of time, say polynomial time, then all of them are solvable in polynomial time. Okay? But that actually doesn't mean that they're algorithmically identical. And if you look at the different, the progress people have made on the different particular problems, it, it seems fairly ad hoc. Um, and the exact quantitative bounds we have for different problems seem unrelated. So um, the best uh, independent set algorithm is due to ropes, and I think it's around. Um, there are two conventions for writing out complexities of exponential time algorithms. One is to write it as c to some power, c, you know, usually some constant to the n. And, but I prefer to write it as 2 to some constant times n, because what, what I think of is if you get a, a factor of 2 in the exponent, okay, that means that you can handle inputs twice as long as if you, don't, if you didn't have that uh, factor of a half there. Okay? So that tells you sort of how, where the, the break point between easy and very hard, how that scales for the, for the different algorithms. And I think that's a better comparison. If you just have c to the n, you really, it's really sort of hard to figure that out. Okay. Um, I think like, you know, 2 to the 80 operations is what we can dream of some computer doing in our lifetime. You know, so if the exponent's bigger than 80, then you know that it's infeasible. And, okay. So, um, okay, so independence set is like 2 to the 0.28n. Uh, three coloring the best algorithms by Beagle and Epstein. It's something like, uh, they, again, they write it out as like 1.3 something to the n. I think that's like roughly 2 to the n over 3, but I, I don't want to, you know, don't quote me on that. Uh, for, for KSAT, the savings over exhaustive search is some constant times n, where the constant is of the form c over k, and that, well, the, the savings over exhaustive search so is of the form uh, C over K, um, where C is a very is also like a very strange number, something like 1.5 something. Yes. So are you are you sort of scaling things using your n so that exhaustion is to the n? Or okay, so that's a good point. Um, So here, in independent set, n is the number of nodes in the graph because a set is a subset of nodes. Three coloring is the number of nodes in the graph because we're giving 
each of the, the, um, the elements. Um, right, so then, so, right? okay. so saying that the, 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 okay, so let me say what we're doing, you know, sort of like the, that, that raises a good point, is that how do we measure improvement So what I'm going to usually do is, is forget about input size per se. Okay. So how much we, how much exhaustive search take really doesn't matter whether you're given your graph in adjacency matrix form or adjacency list form, even though the actual size of the input may that may make a huge difference. What um, we measure in terms of is solution size. Okay, so you look at all for for those parameters of your problem. You look at all problems and how many different solutions there are to all problems. So how many bits it takes to write down a solution, and uh, so exhaustive search is going to be exponential in the in the. Uh, in the solution size, and I'm going to usually refer to the solution size as n. But to be more precise, um, I'm going to be looking at problems where the solutions involve labeling n choices, n um, items with uh, integers in the range, say, 1 to v. So exhaustive search is v to the n, and so improvement is going to be um, v to some alpha n, where alpha is less than 1. And uh, and then I'm going to count as sub x, oh, and then this can be like You know, we do have to look at the input size at some level, but usually, you know, exhaustive search and every step of that exhaustive search, you have to do something with that graph. And then it's going to matter whether it's adjacency list or adjacency format or, or adjacency matrix, but that's just a multiplicative polynomial in the input size. Okay. So, and then um, I'm going to count as sub exponential. Uh, something of the form v to the little o of n, or more precisely, it has sub-exponential complexity if it um, has a v to the epsilon n poly n size algorithm for arbitrarily small epsilon. Okay. The only real difference between this and this is if like the function in the little o might not be computable. You know, sort of a technical distinction. Okay. And the poly size is independent of epsilon or depends on uh, uh, So the polynomial probably will depend on epsilon. Yeah. Or, you know, it might, it, okay, it might depend on epsilon, it might not. But if it depends on epsilon, we can, you know, set epsilon to be a slowly growing function where it's sort of hidden inside this. We can assume that the, the input size is polynomial in the solution size n, and this will save you a lot of problems. Well, for some problems, for most problems, yeah. 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 So, um, anyway, this was convenient. Uh, in a lot of this work to, to distinguish the two. Okay. So, so, um, so we really only care about the input size uh, <coughs> marginally and really are caring about uh, beating exhaustive search, which means ser searching through all candidate solutions. Okay. Um, so that, that brings me, brings up a good point because like the TSP problem, okay, how many bits does it take to describe a tour? Well, roughly n log n, right? So 
Um, so even though the TSP problem takes two to the n time by our best algorithm, dynamic programming, we would count this as a sub-exponential algorithm because it's better than exhaustive search by more than a polynomial amount, more than any constant factor in the exponent. Okay. So some algorithms, you know, some problems in um, NP really do have sub-exponential, not just improved exponential algorithms by this measure. Okay. So that doesn't mean, you know, for a given n that TSP is easier than three coloring. It's just easier relative to what you what you'd expect naively. Okay. So, um, but that, that says you know. So why can't we get a similar improvement for three coloring? You know, wouldn't it be conceivable that we have a three coloring algorithm uh, that's two to the n over log n? Why not? Okay. Um, or you know that for case for k coloring, uh, dating way back to the 80s, there's been a dynamic programming algorithm that runs in time c to the n, and probably Lawler's wasn't even the first dynamic programming. Uh, I think it was just like an improvement on known, because he, he got the constant down a little bit. And it's recently, there's been improvements on this. But that's the the point is that naively it would be k to the n. So as k is growing, um, as k gets larger, this is a bigger and bigger improvement over, over what, um, over exhaustive search. So we can sort of like say the best algorithms can be exponential but with arbitrarily small constants. So there's no real limit to how small these constants can be in the exponent or um, compared to exhaustive search. Um, and they can even be little o of one, not constants at all. So, um, so this thing, like, okay, as we make sort of independent progress on understanding these different problems, is there going to be any kind of unifying theme, or do we need people, you know, one group to be studying independent set, and a different group of researchers to be studying case set, and a different group of researchers to be devising the best algorithms for TSP? Or is there, you know, the other intuition is these are all NP-complete problems. They must be related to each other somehow. Or at least there should be, you know, at some point some, some interplay. But uh, so the situation um, is in, in many ways analogous to um, so I'm going to talk about worst case exact algorithms for the most part, but in many ways it's analogous to um, the situation for approximation algorithms where you have different approximation problems and the known algorithms have very different uh, constants achievable. Um, and, you know, sort of looking at them a priori, you wouldn't see any pattern. But uh, recently we have the unique games conjecture and if the unique games conjecture is true, suddenly for many approximation problems, the pattern falls into place, and you can actually uh, say, you know, characterize by sort of combinatorially and geometrically what this constant really should be. Okay. So the question is, can we do um, the same thing for um, for the constants in the exponents? For the different exponent for the different exponential complexity, have some maybe take a leap of faith, like for the unique games conjecture. But once you've made that leap, um, you start seeing coherent narrative about the relationship between between the the exponents. Okay, so uh, and you know I think. There's no real consensus about whether the unique games conjecture is true or not. There's some evidence that it's true. There's some evidence that it's false. Okay, so um, so you know, people. I don't think even Subash is wanting, you know, is selling people to believe the unique games conjecture. He's saying this is an interesting conjecture, whether it's true or false. We, we, this is something important to work on. Okay, 
So, um, so what we what we're driving at is um, a complexity theory of the exponential time for different n p complete problems uh, that uh, that can answer the following type of questions: When are n p complete problems? When are their complexities linked, and when are they independent? Um, you know, are we should we be studying these problems together or separately? Okay. Um, how much more dramatic progress can we make? You know, we can. You know, there have been like a sequence of papers that you know uh, improve the exponents, maybe like the second digit and then the third digit, and so on. Just like uh, in in approximation algorithms, they often like it. You know get a factor of 4 and then 1.7 and then 1.3 and then the next paper is 1.29 okay so then you're starting to converge so um, are we going to converge or is there much more dramatic po progress as possible for these problems um, what do the hard instances of these problems look like and you know if you want to design hard instances what uh, should the hardest instances look like can we come up with some some idea of, of which instances of the problems are going to be hardest. Um, and, uh, you know, instead of having a mishmash about the current state of the art, can we have a principled, you know, it's not, we're, until we pre be able to prove p not equal np or p equals np, we won't know the complexity of these problems, but can we have a principled educated guess for how these different complexities should go? Um, okay, and I have to admit we still don't have the answers to all of these questions, but um, we have a, a, a reasonable some reasonable hypotheses that seem at least consistent with the state of the art that if they're true, they explain a lot, and if they're false, they explain a lot. So I'm not again like the unique games conjecture. You know, so we, uh, Mohan and I, carefully call these hypotheses rather than conjectures, because we're not, sh you know, we really think that, you know, it's, it's it's about a fair coin flip whether they're true or not. Okay, but the point is that if it's true, it answers a lot of these questions, and if it's false, it answers a lot of these questions. Okay, not all of them, but, you know, at least it's a start. Okay. This is, this is probably vague, but do, does, does this shed any light on what sort of the proportion of, of easy cases there are? For example, if you think, yeah. if you think the case of, of KSAT, that there's been this huge right. progress, huge right. progress. So, okay. so um, I have to admit, so we're still talking about worst case complexity, not average case complexity. On the other hand, um, a lot of our uh, intuition about what the hardest, especially this question, what the hardest instances should be, we've taken from the um, average case literature, things that appear to be the case experimentally, and for the worst case we have some partial um, <coughs> formalizations uh, of some of these claims. Okay, so in particular um, we have some quantitative bounds, assuming ETH, we have some quantitative bounds about uh, the density of the hardest instances of KSAT. Unfortunately, they're you know, not as precise as you know, thresholds. Okay, even as thresholds, you know, again, there's a big gap. It's a famous problem to close the gap, but um, you know, we're nowhere near as uh, as tight, um, uh, but um, but we can establish that there should be like some range of densities that are, are that are bounded by constants that grow with k that are the hardest instances of k sat. So it's a weak confirmation of uh, the experimental things indicated by the experimental results. Yes. Uh, can you give us some examples of where? So I, I think you know, okay. programming is one, for example, right? Uh, yeah. Um, 
I guess it's also like um, uh, a uh, uh, how you define popular. Okay. So like popular opinion in this room may be very different from <laughs> uh, popular opinion among researchers in computer science, and that may be very different from uh, well, so if you went beyond that, you would get the following opinion. What? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> um, so, uh, so popular, you know, so popular among algorithms people. Yeah, I think like IPL, we don't even have a consensus about what we would guess. Um, some of these others, uh, you know, they have a history of being improved upon, and this is, you know, the, the last 10 improvements have been in the third decimal place, so people aren't really expecting dramatic breakthroughs. On the other hand, sometimes, some, occasionally, uh, we have had pretty good re progress on all of these problems relatively recently. Um, I think like for like the the K coloring constant just dropped below two for the first time. It's, it doesn't touch. I mean, all these progress don't touch the ETH. Yeah. Progress. Yeah. So, it, okay. So I don't know anyone who's seriously who's in the algorithms community seriously trying to refute ETH, which I haven't defined. So let me. Um, let me define uh, ETH. So, okay, I, I probably just um, erased the part that you needed. <laughs> okay, so. ETH, the exponential time hypothesis, sort of like this, there are a number of equivalent formalizations, but um, like the, the simplest is to say, say a problem like 3 sat is not sub exponential time. So there exists a C3 greater than zero so that um, 3 sat requires time to, to the C3n. Okay. Um, okay. And the strong ETH says, okay, well, if 3 sat requires 2 to the C3n, okay, um, then 4 sat should require 2 exponential time and 5 sat and so on. So you can look at these constants. So say that K sat requires time 2 to the CKn, and strong. ETH says that the limit as k goes to infinity of these constants approaches 1. Okay. And I'm going to just uh, mention a weak version of the strong exponential time hypothesis, which is that um, general C and F sat without a restriction on k. Uh, has no algorithm 2 to the alpha n where alpha is less than 1. Okay. So, um, let me say, you know, I don't think anybody is actively trying to refute this one. There may well be people um, uh, who strongly disbelieve these two and are actively trying to 
to break them. Do we know if C3 is less than 1? Uh, C3, yeah, yeah so, so, uh, well, uh, so up here, uh, the best running time for the algorithm is, uh, for Ksat, is 2 to the something like 1 minus C over Kn. So we know that Ck is less than 1 minus something like 1.5 over k. And uh, okay. so every, every, uh, for every fixed k, ck is strictly less than 1 um, by, by known methods. And actually, uh, shoot, um, I should have been done with them by the algorithm. So I should have been done showing you these algorithms by now. Okay, so let me try to jump to that and actually like um, say what, give some examples of improved exponential time algorithms. At least the, I'm just gonna sort of give a hand wavy explanation of a couple of them. Um, okay, so, um, Yes. Are there any uh, non empty complete problems which are kind of due to the end to the experiment? Or? Uh, For every? Well, I mean, there's padding, right? Yeah, there's padding. Um, so, like natural NP complete problems. Uh, Would it be other I than the no, no. exponential Yeah. No. no, I mean that. I mean there would be to for these problems it would. Yeah, for these problems. So that there exists some NP-complete problem. I mean, so as you said, by padding, we can certainly make a, an NP-complete problem artificially that has, say, running time two to the square root of n. No, no, no. But it's the order of quantifiers, right? No, no, no. Right? One fixed problem with an yeah, yeah, definitely not. Every epsilon, for every epsilon, that 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 violates. Sorry. Oh, oh, for every epsilon, which, which did you say for every epsilon, or, or there was an epsilon? Okay, so yes, if it's for every epsilon, then we, in the, if we, sub-exponential in that case is equivalent between problems. But I don't think anybody believes that is possible, and none of the algorithms for natural NP-complete problems are even close. Uh, uh, so... Yeah, I think like the only, the only problem where you have something, you know, people sort of believe might be NP complete where you have such an algorithm is the unique games um, and then um, still the quantifiers are a little tricky in that the epsilon depends on some other epsilon primes in the problem. Um, okay, so, um, so let's look at the, the Tarjan and Trojanowski approach that's been uh, improved by Robeson. Actually, he improved it in the 80s and he's keeping, I'm um, working on it. and. Uh, it's hard to keep track of what his best, <laughs> current best algorithm is. Um, so, um, for independent set. Okay. And it's a, it's a simple backtracking approach. Um, and, uh, so what you branch on is you take some vertex x and you say either x is in the independent set and the neighbors of, the, of x are not, or x is not in the independent set and we'll make a note
uh, we put in an additional constraint, at least um, two elements of n of x are in the independent set. Okay. Uh, so this rule, you make a lot of progress when x has a lot of neighbors. Okay. In this rule, you make some prog make fairly significant progress when x has relatively few neighbors. Like if it has less than two neighbors, then you don't consider this case at all. You just put x in the independent set. And the reason is that, you know, so if we look at the lexicographically first independent set where we favor putting x in, you know, that's only not going to be the largest if there's an independent set wh where, where this is also true. So we're not searching through all independent sets, but we never weed out the largest. For a complete graph, it's true, because we just pick a node and we say x is in the independent set. Oh, that one, right, but the, the second, one. second one leads to a contradiction, and we terminate the search. So, um, so we just take. So that means we'll, on a complete graph, we'll go for two steps. Okay, our first step will branch on x, and say. Uh, Either x is in the independent set, in which case we're done, that's an independent set of size 1, or it's not, and we have to put two neighbors of x in the independent set. And then we'll like look, you know, putting any neighbor of x in the independent set will violate that constraint. And, and we'll terminate. Okay. So, um, okay, so uh, then. Uh, So that's the basic idea. And then you add on a whole bunch of special cases, uh, like triangles and this, this particular subgraph and this particular subgraph. And then uh, an interesting idea of Robeson is you memoize when the graph is less than some alpha n. You instead of solving it recursive, recursively, you explicitly write down what the biggest independent set is in case you uh, encounter exactly this graph again. And he shows that you will, in fact, encounter that graph many times. Okay, so um, okay, so um, so the intuition is that sort of like this is the. You know, if you look at what's happening in a in a typical graph, really this case is doing the the is, you know sort of like the bulk of the work comes from medium degree nodes, because high degree nodes we make a huge amount of progress, low degree nodes we make a huge amount of progress. It's the medium sized nodes, and you know and the um, and where we're going to like get an improved algorithm improve our epsilon by doing hard work is adding to our list of special cases for sort of these medium um, medium degree nodes. And this will save us a little bit, but sort of as we improve, it becomes less and less important. Okay, so is this kind of clear? So what we do is just write down a note to ourselves, terminate if, uh, if we don't satisfy at least two. So, so sort of like all these notes to ourselves are saying at least two of this set, at least so many of this set, at least so many of this set. And then when we make a decision in the future, we modify that note to ourselves. Okay? And if one of those is violated, then we terminate and uh, return false. So it's just a pruning rule. We don't allow it to, um, to um, change how we're branching for the most part. Okay. Even the other thing is, you know, how you exactly you pick the x to branch on, that also is a heuristic and different ways of picking it can give you 
improved algorithms. But again, it's usually you want to pick it with high degree, then low degree, then high degree, and, and so on. Okay. So, um, so Johnson and Zegedy sort of like took this standard back hat cracking approach and they used it to um, say something interesting about uh, the complexity of independent set. So I said, if independent set in general is, is not um, sub-exponential, so if, it ha if there is a constant that requires 2 to that constant times n, then so the first part is that there exists a, a, a degree d, so that degree d independent set. So independent set for degree D graphs uh, requires approximately the same constant and from this they conclude that degree 3 independent set is not sub-exponential. Okay. So, um, okay. So, uh, so how is their argument goes is uh, we just use this above. We use this the uh, branching process above. above while there is a degree greater equal to d node x. And we pick that node to be the one to branch on. Okay. So um, then for each, uh, each graph we produce, so note that this is going to produce possibly uh, an exponential number, a mildly exponential number of, of graphs, you know, along the different branches of this process. Okay. For each one we produce, the reason we, we terminate it is its degree at most d. I guess I should say d plus 1 here. We use a supposed sub-exponential algorithm for degree d independent set. When you say produce a graph, it's like if n of x is not an i, you delete the root delete the neighbors, and x is not an i. That's right. So we delete, yeah, if x is an i, we just delete the neighbors and x and give ourselves 1. If x is not in the independent set, we just delete x. Okay. So, um, Sorry? And leave the note. Oh, it, and we leave the note. They don't actually use that for their analysis because they're only looking at the high degree case. The note's really only useful in the low degree case. And in fact, you know, in the high degree case, you often heuristically wouldn't even bother to keep track of that because not only does it become more of a pain, it's not very useful. Um, okay, but uh, putting it in as a general rule rather than having a lot of case analysis makes it easier to explain what's going on. Okay, so um, 
So, okay. So say that we've got a two to the c sub d algorithm for degree d uh, independent set. Okay. Then um, what do we, this algorithm gives us an algorithm for the general case, and so we have to like multiply this two to the c d n by how many uh, graphs we could produce. Presumably we could do a little bit better than that, but let's do. It. Let's not worry about it, because the graph. You know, we could take advantage that the the graphs are getting smaller as we do the branching. Okay. Well, so let's like look at the number of in branches and out branches. Okay. Well, an in branch, um, we remove at least d plus two nodes from the graph. In out branch, we remove one. Okay. So that means that um, we can have at most n over d plus two of these branches, and at most n of these. And you can get something better than this, but so or we can have at most n n total, at most n over d plus two of which can be in branches. So that means that the total number of, of graphs we could produce is at most n over n choose n over d plus 2. Because you can describe each one as a sequence of ins and outs where there are at most this number of ins. And, uh, and so, um, and this is going to be about 2 to the log d over d times n. Okay. Um, times 2 to the c d n. Okay. So that means the, the general time for the independence set problem satisfies this. Which means, sort of, look, if we look at the constants here, this constant is shrinking arbitrarily. The constants for a d independent set get arbitrarily close to the constant for the worst case. Okay, so that's part A. So it says that, you know, for sufficiently large degree d, it's almost as hard for the d independent set as for the worst case. Okay. And then, um, this is just a gadget reduction. So you look at what happens when you have a degree D node. You can just sort of replace it with a, each node of degree D by a path, uh, and then have each of the edges that work on coming out be a single additional edge from that node. And it turns out, I think you have to put in something like this. And then it's equivalent to, to compressing these to a single node. OK. So that's saying that from degree d on n nodes, we can map that to degree 3 on roughly dn nodes. So that means C3 is at least um, like CD over D. And I think this is right. So C3 goes to C, CD goes to some constant. So C3. CD is going to be at most one, no matter how big. It's actually like at most a third from the rubs, you know. So this says a three. Okay. So all we know is that, so I mean, from this statement, right, we have to pick D large enough that this doesn't overwhelm this. 
and then we get that CD is positive, and then from this we'll get that C3 is positive. It, isn't, it doesn't show that the degree three case is the hardest case, and in fact, by current algorithms, there are, there are much better algorithms for the degree three case, like two to the n over six or so. But it's complete for linear, linear, linear size. size yeah, well, we'll see this, hopefully. Okay. So that's an example. You take an algorithm and you just view it as a reduction, and getting the intuition. It, it, it not, there's not only viewing the algorithm as a reduction, but sort of using the general intuition about this backtracking method, which was that sort of there's always going to be an easy range when the degrees are high, and um, an easy range when the degrees are low, and it's the middle sort of as you improve the algorithm, you have to, you know, what, what's going to happen is this, like, what counts as high goes up. And so this is some kind of quantif quantification of that. That says, you know, as we get improved independent set algorithms, the, the easy case is going to have to be for degree Ds that are, that are hard, bigger and bigger. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, uh, so what, um, what can we say in general about, uh, the, you know, now we want to like classify, okay, now that we did something, we want to say, what did we do? And um, Russell, so this um, this backtracking approach. Um, yeah. I mean, this is you know, I mean, it's used in many different places. Right. Fixed parameter tractability. Do you get similar types of things out of using those? Uh, Local search procedures. Can you get similar relationships? We're gonna we're gonna show that there there's a big relationship between fixed parameter problems, uh -huh. um, uh, and sort of the constants you can expect for fixed parameter problems, and uh, the constants that you can get for the worst case. But hopefully that's gonna be uh, in a. Hopefully I'll get time. Have time to get to that. Some yes. Like the clique, uh, so the clique constants are linear in K. Okay. For example. Okay. Um, okay. So. Okay, so um, so for polynomial time reductions, okay, if we want to show that problems are NP-complete under standard polynomial time reductions, we need a reduction that where the time is polynomial, which means that the size of the instance you produce is polynomial, and if we're making many queries, we can we can make uh, polynomial many queries. Okay, so um, if we want to talk about um, exact exponential or even you know within the same ballpark as far as the exponential complexity, what do we have to have true in terms of the reduction? What was very important? The size. So what we can cope with in the size is only linear. Okay. But what did we gain though? What, what could we relax? The time and the number of queries. Is this linear in the solution size? Yeah. 
Yeah, so, so the solution size for the, for the new instance has to be linear in the solution size for the, the original instance. But we can um, have weekly exponential time, and one way to use that is to make a, a weekly exponential number of queries. And that um, we, we formalized in the notion of uh, surf reduction. So this stands for sub exponential reduction family. So it's really not a single reduction, but just like um, we did there, there was a certain parameter we could play with. And what, the, what, it's, uh, what it is is the reduction that um, for every epsilon, the reduction runs in time and number of queries at most 2 to the epsilon n and produces queries of linear length, but where that linear uh, length can depend on epsilon. So um, if you look at what, um, what um, Johnson and Zegedy did, they showed that The general independence set problem has a surf reduction to the th degree three independence set problem. Okay. So, um, so we're going to show, uh, hopefully, in uh, uh, a few minutes, we'll show uh, that this notion of surf reductions is a lot more general and, in fact, um, uh, ties together very many of the standard NP complete problems. Uh, adaptability, like a, so we make, no. Um, we, we have a lot of times when we make a number of queries, but it's usually like an or query. If any of them are answer, if any of them have a solution, then the whole problem has a solution. It's usually breaking up the solution space into different possibilities. Um, that's not necessarily the case, it's just, that's the easiest way to to think about things. Yes. That's right. Yeah. So we'll have to be go back and be more careful. Um, so here we could get some relationship between the constants um, that's sort of passed over by the surf reduction you can sort of like decode the surf reduction to try to get more quantitative information and occasionally we'll want to do that. But um, this, is, this is at least like saying you're in the right ballpark. So we don't have like a surf reduction that's good enough to say that you know, if you got an improvement in the second decimal place for independence set, you'd get an improvement for three coloring. Um, you know, if you, we, we can only say, you know, if you got a factor of 100 improvement in independence set, you get a factor of 10 for three coloring. Um, so right now it's not really of, of algorithmic significance. I won't even mention practical significance. <laughs> okay, so should we take a five minute break? Uh, okay, let's take a five minute break. <laughs> um, okay, so. Um, what, what we're 
going to do now is prove an analogous statement for KSAT. That's going to help us get going. Uh, it's going to help us answer uh, one of the questions that we asked, which is what are the hardest instances of KSAT? Like, um, like Johnson and Zegedy showed that the hard instances of independence at are constant degree. We want to show that the hardest instances of KSAT are those where every variable occurs a bounded number of times. And that's very similar to the average case, um, average case uh, analysis that's been done for, for uh, random instances of KSAT, where um, as the density, there's a sort of peak density at some constant ratio between the number of clauses and the number of variables, and then the, de then the, the hardness slowly deteriorates. So I want to show that something like that's true uh, actually in the worst case and for, um, for an arbitrary algorithm, not just the heuristics people actually use. And we're going to use um, a similar approach to what Johnson and Zegedy did. And actually, we were doing this in uh, parallel. Um, neither of us knew about the other's work um, around the same time. Okay. So, um, so instead of starting with the independent, a backtracking algorithm for independent set, of course, we want to start with a backtracking algorithm for K set. And the standard backtracking algorithm is DPLL. You take some literal and, uh, I guess, uh, you know, I should say if like phi has an empty clause, you just return false. So if, you, if you've already gotten a contradiction, you say, we're done. Okay. And otherwise, you pick a literal and branch on setting that literal to true if it, and do the search. If you succeed, great. If you, if you fail, then you set it to false and search for the other part. And there are all sorts of variants on this, uh, clause learning and so on. Uh, but, um, but it's a pretty good backtracking method even without these, these modifications. So we want to use the fact that you know, the intuition is, which L should you branch on if there's a literal that appears many, many clauses? You know, what you're trying to do is sort of steer towards getting that contradiction that you can prune. So if there's something that's going to make a lot of progress, a literal that appears in many short clauses, you want to branch on that and, um, and, uh, and make progress by making short clauses towards getting a contradiction which is a clause of size zero. Okay, so um, so we're going to use almost the same argument, except there's a catch. Okay, so we want to say our, our surf reduction from general. I'm going to just look at the three sat case okay. to debounded 3sat, saying like, if there's a literal, OK, clauses of size 1, we just have to set the variables uh, according to those clauses. So assume that very literals, you know, that we removed all clauses of size 1 before we repeat. So if there's a literal, that appears in many, let's say D, I'm going to call it D1, 2, clauses of size 2, branch on L. Okay? And at least one uh, of those branches is going to set uh, D12 variables, other variables. So that's clearly we're making progress in pretty much the same way that Johnson and Zekity did. Okay. Well, and if, if not, uh, if there's a literal that Uh, appears in uh, 
uh, D13, three clauses, branch on that, okay. and that's going to create many two clauses, and that's going to lead us to further progress in this step. Except, so that's the idea, except that there's a lie, <laughs> okay? And here's the lie, okay? Where it, why it doesn't, or the problem where it doesn't work. say, you know, we want to give ourselves credit for creating, when we set x to false, we want to give ourselves credit for creating a lot of two clauses. We want a lot to mean like, you know, equivalent to d11 numbers of variables so that we're making as much progress when we do this step as when we do this step. So we have to have many more um, you know, we want many more two clauses and saying each two clause is kind of a fraction of a one clause of a, of a setting a variable because it's giving us a big restriction. Except what if all the two clauses that we create have this variable y in them? Okay. Well, you know, we've created a million such clauses, but what does that actually mean? it's very likely to be true for the satisfying assignment that y is true and so all of those clauses together can't be more information than y okay so we've never you know and creating one restricting setting x to get one additional variable not very impressive so we should have considered the pair xy <laughs> very good okay so what we'll do in this case is instead of branching on x and then branching on y, we'll branch on, you know, so now uh, what we've got is a kind of sunflower in, within the clauses where we have x or y and then a clause with that or z1 or z2 and so on. Okay. And so um, if there are two literals x, y that appear as the core for d2, 3, okay. so the, here the d1, 2 means the cores of size 1 and the, the whole clauses are of size 2, d2, 3 means that we're have branching on two nodes um, and the clauses are of size 3, d1, 3 means we're branching on size 1 uh, and the clauses are of size 2, uh, the clauses are of size 3. Okay, and uh, so then what do we do here? We branch on, we say either we satisfy the clause x or y, or we don't satisfy either of them. So that's case one. We don't determine which one is satisfied in this case. So we're just creating one clause of size two, not a huge amount of progress. But on the other case, we get all the petals, and that's going to be a very large amount of progress. So this kind of Case two is, yeah, so we can also have not, we can also say not x and not y. It actually turns out to not really matter in the analysis, but uh, especially, especially when you're generalizing to bigger values of k, it turns out to be easier to forget it, you know. Uh,
Okay. So, um, so I'm going to sort of hand wave my way through the analysis of this procedure. Oh, and we stop when, when there's no such, when we stop, when there's no choice that we can make, so no literal that appears in many two clauses, which means that all the two clauses, every literal occurs a bounded number of times, uh, no pair of literals that appear in many three clauses, and in particular no literal that appears in many three clauses. So all of the, all of the, uh, at the end we have a, a bounded, uh, a constant bounded, uh, a number of occurrences of each variable, and hence a constant density. And you have to pick these values carefully. So, um, so lemma one says there are at any time, at most C2, two, two clauses involve a single variable x. And uh, here C2 is going to be D12 plus. Um, uh, D23. Okay. And the reason is, okay, well how in a step where where um, we're doing the one two branches, we don't create two clauses. Okay. Um, so we only create one clauses. So uh, and so if we did that, so assuming that this is true before such a step is true after. If we didn't do the D12 case, that means before the step, each variable occurred in strictly less than this number of two clauses. And then the number of two clauses that we could have created, okay, the only time we create two clauses is the D23 step, is the D13 step. And that means that also no one variable occurred in more than D23 of the clauses we created at that step because other what, because if they did, we would move them to the center and do a, T, a D23 uh, move. Okay, so, um, so at any time we have only a linear number of two clauses, assuming we started with all three clauses. Uh, so we're, we're like, we're like taking, keeping track of all the literals that we're forcing. And I, I should say the one thing that we're not doing in this analysis is like unit clause propagation. We're saying like, these are the only two clauses we're creating. These are, you know, only these clauses. And if we logically imply other things, we're not going to take advantage of it. Okay. Um, does that, does that make sense? Uh, I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> so is it whether you care about having X or is it just yeah. X or not X? Literal. Oh, literal could be X or it could be not X. Is it different if you get in the literal? Uh, okay, but, but involve means as a variable or as negation. Okay, so It's fine. It doesn't really matter. Okay. If I, I guess I should, if I wanted to uh, be variable, I should double. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so in particular, that means that um, that. Uh, okay. Uh, Every two clause 
that's created is either destroyed or um, or is still at the end, still there at the end. Okay, so okay. Uh, how can it be destroyed? Okay, it's destroyed when we create a literal that contains that that's in it. If we branch on a literal and it appears in there, okay, then um, then we remove the two cla the the clauses that contain it. Okay, so. Right. So when a literal is created, it destroys the two clauses that contain it. Okay. And that, but since we said that at most C2, two clauses contain any literal, that means that every step, every, when we create that literal, it, it destroys at most C2 uh, clauses, and thus along any path uh, of this process, we, we, create, we, we destroy at most n times C2. Two clauses. Okay, and at the end, okay, well, it's the end, we stop only because it's sparse. So it's actually like uh, okay, we know we've got the, at most this number of two clauses at the end, or else we would continue. Okay. Okay. So, um, okay. So, so now let's bound the total number of, of moves of different kinds. So again, like in the Johnson's Zegedy, we can say a path through this process is either like an in or an out, so either a core or a pedal move. Okay, and I'm going to like say the sizes of, of the different things. So, uh, so how many one two moves each pedal uh, sets um, sets d one two new literals. So. Um, Okay, and each core destroys one two clause. It also creates one literal, but okay. So um, so that means the total number of one two moves. Sorry, cre and just sorry, each core destroys. Sorry, D12, two, two clauses. Okay. So, um, okay. Okay. Or we can, I guess we can even say like or sets one literal. I guess it's easier probably to say that's one literal in this case. I'm thinking about the more general case, but okay. So how? So again, we can describe the one-two moves as a sequence of core and pedal. Okay, the one-two moves. So okay, and since each since we're each time we're creating at least one literal, okay, setting at least one literal, either the core or all the pedals, there can be at most n moves total. And, and at most n over d12 are pedals. So along any branch, we can describe the list of one two moves, okay, as a sequence of at most n 
Boolean values, and most n over d12 of them are uh, come out petal. Okay, so we're looking at a sequence of p's and c's, but at most this a uh, small fraction of p's. And so, like before, we get at most n q's n over d12 uh, such sequences. Okay. How about the the two three moves so the core creates one two clause and the pedal sets D two three literals. Okay. So now we, we know that at most this number, okay, so um, that's going to be some constant times n, where that constant is, is this kind of mess. So, okay. And um, the number of pedals, again, is like n of pedal moves can be at most this. Okay. So as d23 gets large compared to c, and you know, so C just depends on, uh, okay, well, it sort of also grows linearly, but you say this is, is better, <laughs> choose, them right choose them in the right order, then you can make this arbitrarily small. Okay? And then uh, the three, the one three moves, okay, well, the core, sets one literal, the pedal um, creates D2, D1, 3, two clauses, and we have some bound on, on the total number of two clauses that are ever created, and so that gives us the bound on um, on how many pedal moves we can have. So we can have at most uh, n uh, core moves plus, plus Cn over D13 pedal moves and at most this number of them can be can be pedal moves. So again uh, we can pick D13 to be large compared to the other constants. It didn't in influence C at all in this case, um, and make this as small as possible, as small as we want. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, so when we're done, so then we have, then we just make a query. To our balance formula, our algorithm for the, for the. Um, oh, this query, uh, this means here you don't eliminate yeah. the proof of the sunflower, then I will prove it as you go along for this. Uh, you know, so either we have a sunflower or we don't. That's all that we're saying. We don't need any to say that such sunflowers must exist. And we don't need like an exact sunflower, we just need. So it's okay if. Uh, they intersect more than, than what we're showing as the core. In the general case here, it doesn't really make sense. Okay, so, um, okay, so, and we can generalize this to, to, um, to KSAT. So I'm being a bit hand wavy here, but this is sort of the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, um, okay. So, so we call this uh, the the sparsification lemma. Okay. Um, and okay. 
if you look at the standard reduction from k sat to okay, like before, the standard reduction in the Johnson's Egity thing, the standard reduction from degree d to degree three independent set uh, uh, took made the number of nodes proportional to the number of nodes plus the number of edges. So here, in the standard, if you look at the standard reduction from three from k sat to 3 sat, okay, the new number of nodes is the old number of nodes plus the old number of clauses. The Cook Rita, yeah. Standard, okay, uh, Cook reduction. Also, it's, it was important also in that case that because you had found a degree and this was linear. That's right. So, so what we're going to do is we say k sat we sparsify, and we get a sparse k sat, you know, of bounded, so a k sat of bounded density. Okay, this is a surf reduction, and then each one we reduce to 3 sat, and so uh, of linear size. Okay, and so this combine gives, so it shows that for every k, k sat surf reduces to 3 sat. Okay. And if we tried just the reduction in advance without doing the sparsification, we, we wouldn't get anything because, uh, okay. So, um, so one conclusion we can draw is If not ETH, then K sat is sub exponential for every K. Okay. Um, So, um, don't you also get something here for the constant? Yeah, yeah it's implicit, yeah. but but it, it's gonna. So, the faster the algorithm you have um, for three set, sort of the the bigger the density that you need to set things at, and so you get actually a worse, a worse reduction. So even if 3 sat is really fast, the k sat is going to be relatively slow, slow as k increases. Uh, no, so the, the strong ETH, you mean? Yeah, so ETH doesn't know to imply, imply strong ETH. Okay, so, um, okay, so uh, actually, okay, I'm going to like consider a general CSP, and here I'm going to like get the analogy to, um, to the unique games conjecture under you know, the n unique games conjecture, we get hardness of, okay. So like we can get like a conclusion about arbitrary constraint satisfaction problems. Saying, so uh, I claim we can do the same thing for an arbitrary constraint satisfaction problem with error DK and, um, and values in the range 1 to v, okay? So where v is constant, okay? So, um, so a, a CSP is some kind of, you have n variables, each of which take values in the range 1 through v, like k coloring, for example, and you have some relations that tell you what 
tell you constraints on, on um, the labels of these nodes. Some, some kind of relation that tells you uh, that some property has to hold between the va two values. Okay. So if you look at, um, so what I claim is that uh, there's a linear, from, K, from any CSP uh, Verity K, there's an easy linear size reduction to K sat. So the arity is the size of the constraints. Yes, I should say. Should have put it like this. Sorry. So um, and you say like so. Ksat is the special case when you know Ksat is a CSP where the arity is k and the values are zero one. So V is two. But we can include anything. So we just say, let's have like X V I stand for X I has value V. Okay. Um, and then we can just write, you know, for any tuple that doesn't satisfy the relation, write down the negation of that tuple. As a as a clause, okay, and that's expressing this case case um, CSP as a case at formula, <coughs> and the number of variables just grows by this factor v, which I'm assuming is constant. Okay, there are probably more efficient ways of coding it, but that's okay. So. Um, So let me see. So, uh, okay. So that means that uh, we can map any CSP with just a linear size reduction to KSAT and then do a surf reduction to 3SAT. So if 3SAT is easy, sub-exponential time, then every CSP is easy. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, and actually, So, uh, if you have a, a CSP and a kind of circuit, uh, you know, some additional constraints that are expressed by an arbitrary circuit, um, then I claim you can, you can use use um, this reduction to reduce the CSP part to KSAT, and then if you reduce the circuit part to 3SAT, uh, you just create a number of variables as proportional to the circuit size. You need one new variable per gate of the circuit. And so, uh, in particular, we can do things like addition. Okay, so, um, so let's look at the, the uh, max CSP problem, where instead of looking at um, uh, looking at uh, trying to satisfy all the relations, we're trying to satisfy the maximum possible number of relations, like maximum independence. Well, no, so maximum independence set, you're trying to like, m so maximum independence set is a good one, okay? So there we have a CSP, which is an independent set, and a circuit saying the size of I 
is at least k. And this circuit is linear size. So we can reduce that to 3 sat and, uh, and get a sub-exponential independent set algorithm. Okay. But I want to actually say max CSP is a little bit more complicated. Okay. What I claim is we can get an approximation sub-exponential time approximation scheme for max CSP, any max CSP problem if ETH is false. Okay. And here's the intuition. So sample a large linear random set of constraints. Okay. So we have a possibly, so in our max CSP problem, we maybe have n to the k different constraints. But I claim that if we do a random sampling of constraints the, and look at the maximum for that, it approaches the very rapidly the, um, the value of the original set in, in terms of the fraction of satisfiable constraints. Okay. Um, okay. And then add a circuit counting them, counting the number of satisfied and reduce this. It's not obvious, it's true. Okay. So you can't have some situation where you can sort of satisfy any half of the string that you want. Well, this linear has to be bigger than n, right? It, well, so it's big, bigger than n, but so what I claim is that if you want it to, uh, so say like if you look at the number of possible assignments, that's going to be like uh, n log v. Okay, so you need this over like epsilon squared. If you pick this many random constraints, then by a turnoff bound, uh, every single assignment ha is a pretty good approximation to um, to what it should be within epsilon. Okay, does that make sense? So you have to the the lin linear depends on how so it's an approximation scheme. So the, the reduction also depends on the quality of the approximation. Okay. So, um, so saying, okay, so if ETH fall, fails, then it doesn't just mean that 3SAT is easy. It means that all of these kind of natural NP-complete problems, approximation problems, and so on are easy. You know, so, you know, like a huge fraction of, of NP problems are these constraint satisfaction problems. Okay, does it make sense? Okay. Okay. TSP does not fall in constraint satisfaction because it's not like a local thing. You have to say it forms a cycle. So Hamiltonian path is not clear. And it's not, and it also doesn't have a constant number of values, depending on how you formalize it. If you formalize it as each node you pick where to go next, then the number of values grows with the graph. Do you think that these problems are surreproducible to three sets? It's not clear, yeah. I don't know how to do it. Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. Even if you made it a problem on the edges, it's still not the. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How about um? So this says if if ETH fails, we get a sort of global picture of what's going on. How about if ETH is true? Okay. Um, 
so there's a general conjecture, okay, uh, the dichotomy conjecture. That says every um, CSP um, is either in P or um, is NP complete under gadget reductions. And I'm not going to define what a gadget reduction is, but the important thing for us is that it's it's linear in the number of the number of variables and the number of constraints is linear in the number of vari that you get under the, a gadget reduction are both linear in the number original number of variables and constraints. Okay, so um, if ETH is true, every CSP that is complete under gadget reductions requires exponential time, which um, if the dichotomy conjecture is also true would mean that every uh, CSP is either in P or requires exponential time. It would be a gap theorem that said that there's nothing, nothing in between. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, so why? So we could start with like K sat surf reduced to three sat, and then you know linearly reduce. Um, to the CSP. So once, once the three set to, to like sparse three set, and once the three set is sparse, then um, the size of the CSP instances are going to be linear under the gadget reduction. Um, that I, I don't think so because well, I don't know. I haven't really thought of it. Sorry. Um, okay. And also as a consequence, every CSP has uh, hardest instances, has exponentially hard instances. Every such CSP of linear density. Because if we then like reduce back to the, you know, we start with the, we, we can start with an arbitrary instance of the CSP, reduce to case that uh, in, in, with linear overhead, and thus self-reduce to something with linear, uh, linear density. So it says the hardest instances of all CSPs have this linear density problem, or at least a hard instance of all CSPs is linear is the linear dense version. Okay. Um, so this is the end of the first part of my talk. <laughs> um, yeah, but maybe not today. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. So um, if you want to like schedule uh, a second part, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, maybe I'll just like state the claims. Okay. Um, so uh, Okay. 
So, um, so let's let C infinity be the limit of uh, C k as k goes to infinity. So the strong exponential time hypothesis is that this limit is one, and we have current algorithms that make bound C C k away from one by about one in k. Um, so here's um, what we show is that uh, for every k, ck is at most 1 minus omega 1 in k away from c infinity. So even if it's not 1, each k set is strictly um, better. So Saying, so another way of saying this is for every k, there exists an L so that ck uh, is less than 1 minus omega 1 in k times cl. So this says unless these are all zero, they're all sub-exponential, uh, k sat is strictly easier than L sat for a large enough L. So that gives the intuition that k sat is really um, getting harder. And to get this kind of reduction, we actually have to get this, go, this kind of statement, we actually have to give a reduction that not only doesn't increase the input, but actually makes it compresses the input. No, um, the number of variables. So we have to reduce uh, k sat with n variables to L sat with strictly fewer than n variables, n minus 1 in order 1 in k variables. Okay, uh, the number of clauses is going to actually grow, but okay, so that's one thing. So it says that we can actually show that uh, use this ETH to show that uh, there's a hierarchy. Okay, so uh, all CSPs are exponentially hard, but some are harder than others. Okay. Uh, Uh, actually, I think this, this next result is sort of implicit in something you did, Joe, um, with Uri Feige. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Uh, like independence at, or maybe you called it, maybe you were using clique as the equivalent, yeah. for a small clique to big clique. Okay. Um, okay, so I should say also. It's not so hard to show that ETH implies the independent set is hard. Okay, so you just have to say the, the standard three sat to independent set is, is kind of a gadget reduction. It increases the number of nodes and variables by linear amounts in the number of variables and clauses. So if we have a linear size three sat, we can reduce it to independent set on a linear size graph. Okay, so even degree three, if we Okay, so um, so ETH implies this is hard, and then um, it says okay, we, we can look at like the K in the or say L problem, which is you know fix L, is there an independent set or equivalently clique? In, of size exactly L. And for every L, this is a polynomial time. This is going to be like an n to the sum constant, let's call it d sub L. Okay. Um, and ETH implies that this constant is grows linearly in L. So this is a connection to fixed parameter tractability that was brought up before. Okay. This also shows that um, that somehow uh, uh, the exponential time hypothesis can tell you something not just about algorithms in in exponential time and p-complete problems, but actually basic problems in p. What you'd expect their complexities to be. 
although with this kind of parameter, it's still like asymptotic in terms of some parameter. Okay. Um, and uh, a similar result is uh, the uh, L sum problem is sort of the the case of um, of subset sum where you're only picking L of the numbers um, requires time n to the theta L. Okay. And this was a problem. Uh, studied, well studied in computational geometry and also it's sort of an assumption that was used in computational geometry to reason about other problems. Okay. And the final thing, um, uh, Yeah, that the complexity grows with the dimension as you th would think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay, so this is what you get from. Yeah. So you, you might get a better, you might get better if you have strong ETH, but. Uh, This, this was mentioned by Petrescu and Williams. I don't know. They claimed it was useful. I don't, I, I would, I'm going out of my area of expertise. Okay. So they also show that strong, this is kind of a, um, a, a curiosity. I don't know, uh, but it, it seems like a, a pretty interesting connection, sort of like the uniform non-deterministic number on the forehead complexity three so three party number on the forehead communication complexity of um, of set intersection is Omega is linear in the number of, in in the range of the size of the sets. So okay, so they say if you've got a communication protocol, okay, and what uh, you have to be able to actually you actually have to be able to carry out the communication protocol with a Turing machine, uh, and it has to work in like exponential time in the number of bits. So, you, you know, so you have to be able to like at least like in time, you have to be able to write down a, a kind of whole strategy tree for the players um, in time proportional to the, to the size of the tree. Yeah, so you, you can't, I mean, it would be hard to imagine coming up with a protocol that where it wasn't, at least that explicit, where you could write it down in terms of. So I think the, the point of having it be non-deterministic is just that it, if you didn't have this, it's already known to be hard. So I think, you know, linear bound for even probabilistic protocols, you know. Well, three-party is easier. Number than two party, yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, I think uh, what Zegedi and Nasan, Nasan and Zegedi, Baba and Nasan and Zegedi show like k party for pro probabilistic is n over two to the k. You have to decide whether the sets intersect. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, you're right, the yeah. Intersection, the best law of bound, that's why I was confused. The best law of bound is just like n to the fourth. 
Okay, so, so if that were tight and it was constructive, that would disprove strong ETH. So, um, so these things are true, and uh, if you don't, it, you know, I'm not going to keep you even further from lunch, but um, I'd be happy to talk about them on a different day.